Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature webcast and podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives take an in-depth, nonpartisan look at a range of topics that matter most to business leaders. We'll sit down with experts and discuss a variety of subjects and do what we do best at the Conference Board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board and the host of this series. And today we're going to talk about the great resignation or the great reshuffle. What's going on? What's been going on in this mass resignation that we've seen in the past couple of years? Is there an end in sight? And what should people be considering when they're weighing a job change? Today, joining me is Rebecca Ray, a leading voice in the workforce and workplace. And she's also the leader of our Human Capital Center here at the Conference Board. Rebecca, welcome. Well, thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to join you. Yeah, so Re Rebecca, I don't know that anybody out there has not heard about the great resignation or the great reshuffle, but talk about what it is, the, some of the numbers that you've seen and uh, what's been happening. Well, you know, Steve, um, I've heard this uh, referred to many ways great resignation that you mentioned, the great reshuffle, the great reimagining, the great reconsideration, the great regret, the great, you know, it's it's certainly a time where people have had a chance to go through a very different experience collectively as, as maybe global citizens and really give some thought as to why does my life look this way and do I want it to continue this way? So there's, even if they didn't make any changes, it certainly was, I think for all of us, a great reexamination of who we are our relationship to work, our purpose and meaning in life. And so part of that did look like a great resignation. You know, I think, I think if you, you step back a little bit, you know, you had about 47 million people who resigned their uh, positions in 2021. Now, some of that is the pent up non-movement from 2020. And if you look at some of the BLS numbers in terms of resignation rates, you can see that it's kind of a linear projection upward, which has been happening for the last five or so years, been in the making, uh, but you didn't have uh, so much movement in 2020. So some of that was pent up. Uh, some of it also is uh, reflective of where this generation is, you know, millennials and sometimes Gen Z, they're on the move. That's what you would have expected from pretty much any cohort at that life stage. But I think also it's, it's part of, this restlessness that we've all been through. We've had some time to think about our lives and many people are deciding, I either don't like being fill in the blank or I don't like being whatever that role is in this organization or I'm not sure that I can't uh, make a living or make my way in the world without a full-time job and kind of re-examining their relationship to work. What's different I think this time is that people have left in much greater numbers without something else in their hand which is different in this generational, uh, this, this, this time around. This generation has been stepping off the curb without something else in their hand, whereas earlier generations, mine included, uh, would probably have waited until they had a firm offer and usually in writing uh, before you know, leaving an organization. And that's different. You have to respect that though, I think. Yeah, no, it, 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 it is interesting. So Rebecca, do you see that this is a US only phenomenon or where else are we seeing this happen? You're seeing it in most of the developed countries and you know it's the kind of thing where we've we've had an opportunity to leverage technology and for many people who do have the option to work remotely they have seen you know how technology can be leveraged but particularly in those uh, countries especially here in the U.S. where people were given either stimulus checks or support it helped people be a little bit more uh, flush with cash and they felt as though that would help them land safely even if they didn't have something in hand when they stepped off. So I think that's part of it. Yeah, and, and it's not hitting every industry and every you know, job title the same. I mean, we're seeing a lot of this right in, uh, in office work. What, what are some of the other places that are affected by it, some of the other industries and which industries are not being affected? Well, I'm not sure that there's no industry that's affected because I think everyone's sort of in a war for talent right now. People are, are fairly uh, open to being on the move. But uh, I think a lot of the movement is, you've heard some people refer to this as the great reset. You had a lot of people who were among the lower paid workers in a variety of industries. And so many of them became overnight essential workers in the minds of many. And then they were able to parlay that into um, more highly compensated positions elsewhere. 
And so what you're seeing in some cases is entire uh, swaths of a profession where they've gotten sort of an upgrade in terms of their compensation by virtue of the fact that they have been so mobile and in that scramble for talent up went wages. So this isn't just a, you know, an office environment issue. You're, we're seeing this, you know, across retail and, you know, some of the low end jobs, restaurants and so forth. And, um, and we're seeing it broadly across uh, a ver variety of professions, right? So it, it is, there is something more here. And, you know, as you said, it's, it tends to skew younger in the generational, uh, in, in the generations, but not solely the younger generation. So there is something broader. So then it makes you wonder, was this just triggered by the pandemic? And, you know, everybody was, you know, we shut the economy down and everybody sat home and then they, they reevaluated their lives. Is that really what's driving it? I think there's a lot of factors at play. And in a moment, I want to talk about a trend that we're seeing emerge, which I think is going to make people think about this a little differently, maybe sit up a little taller in the chair. Um, I do think that the opportunity to, to reflect uh, is a piece of this, an opportunity to take a look at how their lives and particularly the blending of their personal and professional lives might look different if they did other things. And you know, when people have had an opportunity to balance a little bit more uh, without perhaps the commute, to be able to spend time with family, to be able to take breaks, to be able to go out and run in the middle of the day if that's your habit, or you know, to, to figure out how the work gets done in a more flexible way. People are demanding the flexibility that that has afforded. Now, I, I think that's a piece of it, but I also think there's something about the American psyche in particular that has said, look, the world isn't necessarily lining up the way I thought it might when I began my career. And, you know, there was a time long gone when people would stay at the same job for X number of years and get a watch and be done and get a pension. And that world is pretty much gone. And so you have people who are thinking about and seeing success stories of people who are putting their lives together in different ways and saying, why can't I do that? So, do you, do, you know, as, as you've evaluated this and you, you, of course, are an expert in the whole field, but are, are you seeing that people are running away from something that, you know, finally I've, I, I've had it, I got I to gotta run away, or are they running towards something, meaning, aha, Eureka, you know, I've, I figured out that, you know, all of these factors you just talked about are so important and therefore it's leading me to this. In other words, is it driven by introspection or just finally the, <laughs> the ability to have freedom and do something else? Right. I, I think it's a combination. And, you know, people... I think become open to a recruiter's siren song about the wonderful new place that they could join only after they have decided that there are enough things in their current situation that make them open to that conversation. I mean, if you work for a caring, supportive, empathetic boss, you're gonna look a long time before you leave that person and decide, you know, let's just try it and see if we land in a, in a good place at the next one. I think there's also a couple of things that I'm hopeful we get a chance to, to talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, the choices to go, but uh, you know you have you have people who are uh, perhaps earlier in career. They may have sort of an unrealistic expectation of the workplace or what the workplace can provide. There's no question that these uh, generations that are coming into the workplace see work as part of an extension of who they are. Many of their friends are here. There's a great deal more social interaction. And so uh, when that gets disappointed, it is, uh, it's not just the job, it's also sort of the social fabric. Now, it doesn't take much for these things to catch fire. So if a couple of your friends have just hopped to someplace else for a 30% bump, after a while and the fourth person is gone, you're going to say, you know what, why am I not, why am I here? And the challenge for those who are left behind is that the work of the good friends who've just left has now magically landed on your desk. And so that's part of what fuels burnout. And sometimes people leave out of self-preservation because they're promised either more flexibility or a manageable workload or a variety of other things, plus perhaps an increase in salary. Although some of our research shows that people leave, uh, generally speaking, for salary increases or career development. That has never, that's been the same for decades. Uh, but they are also leaving because they think that they might actually uh, have a respite, a little chance to take a breather and then start again somewhere new. And that's part of a self-care movement that I think is, is well underway among workers, among all of us probably. Yeah, you know, it, it, if you look at the generational thing, you, you know, the, the younger generations at this period of time tend to be the, doing the reshuffle, meaning that they're, they're going somewhere else. Um, but we have seen 
a lot of baby boomers, who, the youngest of whom I believe are around 58 years old, but a lot of baby boomers have chosen during the pandemic to just say, okay, you know, uh, enough, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retire. And so they're taking themselves out of the workforce entirely. And therefore, we've seen the labor participation rate drop. Do you think that that is going to be reevaluated now that we're heading into a recession and you know, people may actually run out of money, the markets come down and, you know, they've got some volatility. Do you think that these baby boomers will come back or do you think it's been a one-way trip? You know, I, I think there'll be a mix, but I'm, I'm sure many will come back. Do you remember the, the headlines not too long ago about the brain drain and the concern about retiring baby boomers and, and, and you know, the world was going to collapse because they were going to be leaving. And then we had a recession and many, many stayed so that their 401k could crawl back up. And I think the recession will change the mindsets or maybe some of the decisions for some people. Uh, I, I think also uh, you're looking at a group of people who are looking not to leave um, entirely, but will look to stay connected to the workplace in maybe some kind of a part-time fashion or working as a consultant. In other words, they'll continue to work maybe in a portfolio or second act career, um, but it may not look like full-time work and yet they are still going to be working. So. You know, smart companies, I think, will begin to think about how you um, how you stem the exodus of that, because as senior people leave, you lose a great deal, especially those who are mid-career. They have uh, talents, they have organizational knowledge, they have uh, institutional memory, and they have customer relationships that are painful if they leave. It's one thing if someone earlier in career, they're a little easier to replace. But what we're seeing now is an uptick in the number of managers who are resigning. And that should concern organizations a great deal. Those are harder to replace. They have larger scopes of responsibility and it makes a more difficult situation for the managers who are left. And we also know that the loss of someone's boss is one of the larger factors in attrition. So then you're gonna have this ripple effect through the next layer down from that senior leader who's just left. But LinkedIn, se several uh, organizations are reporting that uh, managerial postings are on the rise and they are rising at higher rates, whereas those who are not in managerial positions are staying pretty much stable. So that should concern people when you start to see that begin to happen in larger numbers. I don't think that's as prevalent in the mindset yet, but it will be soon. Well, the other thing that we know, Rebecca, is that women have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic because of uh, the need to deal with family care, either child care or elder care, which disproportionately falls on women. And so now, you know, as the, we come out of the pandemic and out of the period of time, the question is, will women flow back into the workplace? And some have, but it, we still are down significantly on the proportion of women who are still out of the workforce. How do you think that's going to resolve itself? Uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Steve. I mean, it, it was a disproportionate hit and many women have returned to the workplace, but not in the same numbers as men. So I think some of the challenges are still there. Uh, disproportionately, elder care, child care still falls on women. And that's despite you know, the many forward thinking, fabulous people, couples who try to put their lives together. But at the end of the day, it does particularly hit women uh, in, a, in a larger way. And so they still have, in many cases, either small children who cannot be vaccinated or can't, they can't afford child care, particularly in a rising inflationary period or they have elder care uh, challenges. And so you still have women who are caught in the midst of this. So companies need to be thoughtful about what could we do so we don't lose a generation of women leaders, for example. You know, all the strides that we've made about you know, advancing women and people of color into the leadership ranks, my fear is that if we don't um, thoughtfully address this, we're gonna lose some of the ground that we've made. And, and what might that look like? So it might look like different types of scheduling or different types of work arrangements that allow people to have more flexibility because those are the responsibilities that they have. It might look in some cases like underwriting the cost of childcare or elder care. It might look like helping uh, women uh, be able to more easily come back into the workplace after a sabbatical that might be short-term, planful, and, uh, and part of a, a progression uh, process uh, for a leader in particular. So I think that's the way we have to take a look at how we can make the workplace more functional for folks. So for example, uh, you know, I'm not suggesting that we, we you know, build out mini cities in a lot of these corporate headquarters, 
but if we could make it a little easier so that there was childcare on site, so that there were meal preparation plans, so that people didn't have to leave the, uh, the workplace to go and get lunch. I mean, everything depends on where you are, what kind of a setting you're in. But there's some thoughtful things that people can do. And I think the easier we could make it for a working mother, for example, to order meals and pick them up, or a working father, for that matter, to pick them up on the way home, you know, that's the kind of thing that I think companies should be thinking about. How do we help make this easier? What's the level of flexibility we're comfortable providing or offering to all of our employees to make this a great place to work and a stickier place that they don't want to leave? We've talked about some of the causes of the great resignation. Next, we're going to talk about what people should be thinking about when weighing a career move. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. As you and your company monitor the latest wave of shocks that have battered the U.S. economy, the award-winning forecast team at the Conference Board now predicts a U.S. recession by the end of 2022. This recession will further compound the crises that have recently upended expectations, from a deadly pandemic to a war in Ukraine and the highest inflation rate in decades. Yet, unprecedented crises also present unforeseen opportunities if you have a trusted, proven navigator by your side. With that in mind, the Conference Board continues its long-standing tradition of providing timely and relevant content on a daily basis to help guide the business community through the economic storm. These trusted insights are being gathered on our website and are available to help your company master the challenges ahead. Chart a course for the future, which will allow your business to emerge stronger on the other side by visiting our free economic hub entitled Navigating the Economic Storm, Your Indispensable Guide Through the Global Recession located at www.conference-board.org slash topics slash recession. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Dr. Rebecca Ray, who's an expert on all things human capital, and we're talking about the great resignation or the great reshuffle. So, Rebecca, you know, we've seen these trends for the past 40 or 50 years. I mean, you and I have experienced it, uh, you know, for the, at least the past 40 years. And we've seen cases of people, you know, earlier in their career, constantly, you know, moving. So a lot of this is being positioned as a Gen Z or a millennial thing, but is it really, or is it just, does this happen in every generation, every life stage, you know, when people are earlier in their careers trying to find the right thing, move ahead, and, and, and so forth? Traditionally, there was less movement in earlier generations. Uh, I think you're seeing more of it now, but I think it's part of a continuation of a, of a trend, and I, I'm not sure that will go anywhere, anywhere soon, anytime soon. But I think one of the things that we probably should help young people or earlier in career folks understand is that your career is a thoughtful game of chess. And so where your next move might be, should check several boxes. It's either a massive career advancement or it's an opportunity to work with an iconic brand, a company that's known for developing leaders, or it's the opportunity to learn um, a, a corollary piece of the business that more, makes you more well-rounded. There is something to be said for weighing the experience long-term at a company versus moving into a different one. And I, I fear that many uh, people now went very quickly through a process. And I think companies tried to move very quickly. So we all knew the headlines and we all knew from experience, the longer you take to hire, you, you run the greater risk that you lose that person before you can actually close it. And they will have probably other multiple offers and you may simply lose them as candidates. So that's one thing. So companies are pretty fast on moving people through. So if you had everyone interview, everyone on the team interview a, a prospect, now it was just a select few. And it's not that you dropped your standards necessarily, but you did try to move through the process very, very quickly. Then you had candidates who were looking to move quickly because they're surrounded by success stories by their friends or the headlines or what they believe to be true about people who are just, you know, hopping and it was just such a hot market and, you know, this should only take a week. So you have two kind of um, two forces, the candidate and the organization trying to move very, very quickly. And, you know, I don't uh, know about your personal life, but speed dating necessarily doesn't end well. And that's kind of what we've just been through is speed dating. And so some of those will be lasting fruitful marriages, but some of them will not. And I fear that some 
sometimes earlier in career folks haven't gotten the guidance from somebody who's seen this, you know, have been to the dance before and think about why are you moving? What are you moving from? What are you moving toward? What are the kinds of questions you should be asking for? And what are some of the red flags? I do think that some of the stories about regret, uh, you're hearing people talk about the fact that they were offered one thing or it was positioned usually at a, a higher level of responsibility or, or uh, impact, which is a, a big driver for this generation. And when they got there, it just wasn't. So that's, that's the problem with speed dating. Yeah, I'm going to come back to this, this notion of regret in a minute. But, you know, you said earlier in the first half, you talked about people leaving for a lot more money, uh, of course, and wages are going up naturally because of the inflation rate and, and so forth. But, um, you know, chasing money or a title is one reason to move. Um, is it really a valid reason in the long term? Or, or you know, do you, do you think that the people who are experiencing, you know, some concerns and regret later uh, focus too much on that versus long-term fit and career development? So chasing a title and, uh, and money, you know, if you, what happens is sometimes people do that a couple of times and all of a sudden you're now hired at a level beyond your level of competence. And so that's when it catches up to you and that's when you start to pay the price. Now, having said that, um, sometimes that is the way for people to get ahead. And so the question I would have is what happened in the existing organization that people didn't have a conversation, multiple conversations with this person around their career aspirations and the path to get there and how it was going to be possible for their organization and how that manager was going to support that person to not only be effective and fabulous now, but to be prepared for that eventual career move that they'd like to have. So there's, there's failure on a couple of different levels here. And I think that just um, reminds us all that managers have really only two jobs. That's to help your people be fabulous now and be fabulous in the future. And hopefully they can make several career moves within an organization and keep that great talent in the, in the house. But that's what managers should do. It's not, a, it's not an add-on that you do a couple of times a year during a performance review or a development conversation, but it should be all the time. What can I do for you? How can I help? What do you need? People don't leave a manager like that. Yeah, I, well, it, I, it, you know, that's, that's, that's really great wisdom. I think that, um, you know, I wonder uh, also, uh, you know, I guess in the past it was, I don't know, it, you may disagree with this, but there was almost more of a trade mentality. You know, I'm going to become an accountant or I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to become an electrician. I think you have a lot more people coming out of college today. We have a lot more, um, a lot higher percentage uh, of people with college degrees and they tend to be generalist forms of degrees. And I just wonder how much of this is just people trying to sort through their lives. You know, I, now I think I wanna do this, I've joined, nah, that's not quite right. So I wonder how much of it is, you know, just sort of a different generalist entrance into the workforce. What do you think? Well, I think there are some professions where you are going to be in lockstep. You know, you're going to get certifications in order to be able to, to do your job. You're going to be licensed. And if you're, if you're going to work on Wall Street, you're, you're going to get your, you know, an ASD uh, licenses and you're going to, you know, you're going to go in lockstep. And, and those are the kinds of things that you do. So you don't have a lot of variation on a theme with that role. But I think for a lot of people, you're right. I mean, they have eclectic uh, views. They have uh, eclectic interests. They've been exposed to many things growing up that many other generations never had the opportunity to have perhaps as broad and as global a view. And so I think, you know, you've often talked about this as an expert in marketing, but the more choices you give people, sometimes there's overload and that's not very helpful. So I, I wonder sometimes if that that range of options that people have in these, early, these generations now in the workplace uh, have had is a factor here because everything looks fascinating. Yeah, I, you know, so I, you know, I've experienced this as I've been trying to coach people over the years where you have people going, I'm not sure what I want to do and so forth. And you sit down and you know, you go through a thoughtful exercise about, you know, what are your what are your life goals, you know, what do you want to achieve and so forth. And you try to help them narrow it down. And I just, you know, I wonder if that isn't part of what companies shouldn't be thinking of before they lose people to really work more directly with people. You know, there was, you know, when you and I were 
uh, early in our careers, people told us, you know, you're going to go here, you're going to go there, you're going to do this. And, you know, you kind of, as you said, move in lockstep. But, but I think it, it, it's not, it hasn't been part of a, the, the repertoire of, of leadership within companies to, to do succession planning and career development, meaning let's think about ways to keep you within the organization, but also to grow your skill sets and maybe, you know, maybe redeploy you so you don't have to go somewhere else. How should companies approach that whole subject area? So I think it's a mindset. You know, uh, leaders have to really understand that that's part of their responsibility and they have to be held accountable. Uh, there's a tendency for some managers to want to hoard top talent because that's their star performer. And, you know, if that, if that person leaves, they're in a world of hurt. And so I, I understand the human nature piece of that. Uh, but I think uh, great managers tend not to hoard um, talent. They tend to be known as great developers of people. You want to be on so-and-so's team because you are just going to learn more from that man or woman than you could possibly imagine. And you, you, this is a great opportunity, and, and that's exactly where you, you need to be. So, so I do think that there's something about organizationally rewarding great managers who are great developers of people. Secondly, I think there needs to be a regular cadence of conversations that managers should have with their people about these career conversations. We, we know it's tempting, and look, we all have seen the, the AI-driven you know, recruiting platforms where you can drill down and find just about any skill set you want. The question is, what do you want to pay for? But I mean, you can poach, you can, you can find all of your competitors' people pretty easily these days. So it's not that, um, that these, uh, this talent that you're trying to hoard is going to be protected by your, your bubble where you try to keep them. They'll find them. And that's not the time to tell someone you have great expectations for their career or they're very valuable or you want to be their mentor or whatever comments and, and messages you send. The time to do that is all the time and to help people know that they are in safe hands, not only with this manager or perhaps others, but at that organization. They have a great trajectory. It's a great organization to join. But I think especially we need to make sure people understand the impact that they can have in the course of a career at a company because the, the connection to mission and purpose and the desire to make an impact is absolutely paramount. I think it is for most all of us, but particularly for the generations coming into the workplace and those that are there now, they will walk in a way that earlier generations did not. Yeah, I do think that it's a skill set and the capability that companies need to try to instill in their leaders to work with people to uh, to develop them. I think so much hoarding is one thing, but it's also, you know, the people unsure about, you know, do I, I don't want to over promise and under deliver, or I'm not really sure, you know, what the possibilities are. And so I, you know, this seems like there could be some more um, talent development and formalized processes here so that people can retain the talent, even, you know, even if they don't necessarily retain that, that person in the, in the exact position. Final words back to you. Yeah, you know, um, a lot of the things that people say they want, which is the opportunity to learn and grow, to work with people they respect, to be uh, supported by a manager, to be given opportunities to, to develop and, and advance their careers. A lot of that doesn't cost money necessarily. They're asking to grow. So figure out what somebody wants to do get them a, a, an opportunity to work on a great project or be tapped for something where they can be part of a scenario planning process for high potentials. That costs the organization nothing. It's valuable to the organization, but it's hugely valuable in terms of career advancement and visibility for someone. So think creatively about what you can do to offer people opportunities to be uh, more valuable to the organization and to keep them. And much of that does not require giving them a 30% bump. That's the wrong tool to pull out of the toolkit. Ah, you saved the, the, the most important thing for last. Dr. Rebecca Ray, thanks for being with us. Thanks a lot, Steve, it's a pleasure as always. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week I'll be joined by an expert on subjects that matter most to business leaders. We'll cover topics in geopolitics, economics, human capital, ESG, public policy, marketing communications, and more. Please share CEO Perspectives, both the webcast and the podcast, with your colleagues. I know that they'll want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series has been brought to you by the Conference Board.